Welcome to the sixth and final instalment of my epic trip around South America on the cruise ship Marco Polo. Well, in the previous episode, we concluded our run up the length of the western coast of the continent. At this point, we were ready to wave our fond farewells to the Pacific Ocean and make our way back to the eastern side and the Caribbean. To do that, we have to travel through the Panama Canal. The final leg of our adventure starts in the Gulf of Panama, against the dramatic backdrop of Panama City. Well, as you can imagine, there was a palpable buzz of excitement as we approached the canal. Transit from the Pacific to the Caribbean would take us roughly eight hours in total, passing through no fewer than three locks. The canal was first opened in 1914, but didn't start operating 24 hours a day until 1963. I think it's fair to say that the canal has always managed to divide opinion, mostly on ecological grounds. But there's no denying its place as one of the most spectacular feats of engineering on the planet. That's a mule, one of four tiny trains that run alongside the lock, two on either side, one on each corner. They're connected to the ship with ropes and the job is to help to keep the ship central. A transit time of roughly eight hours means there are lots of opportunities for the artists on board to brush up on their urban sketching skills. This is the Miraflores lock, the first on our passage. I've started out with a straightforward ink drawing using a small black waterproof ink pen. There's a lot going on in the scene, but that's fine. My starting point was the ship's mast. From there, I gravitated outwards. If a scene seems too complex, I always recommend focusing on one single element, then working out from that and seeing where it takes you. Well, I've shaded in a few areas with a 2B pencil, and now I'm adding some selective colouring with watercolour. Prussian blue is perfect for the Marco Polo's front deck, while raw sienna, burnt umber and French ultramarine provide a smattering of localised earthy colours. Well, let's not forget the roof of the building and the red hull of the ship in the top right hand corner of the scene. For this, I've used cadmium red. Finally, to give the drawing extra impact, I've accentuated selected elements with a chunky black marker pen. I'm 
sure there were some passengers who were unmoved by the experience. Well, it's possible that Panama Canal veterans become a little blasé about the process, but even those who see it as a necessary evil must surely be hard-pressed not to be at least secretly wowed by the sheer scale of the operation. Not to mention the huge cargo ships that passed close by from time to time. Personally, I found it fascinating and rather fun. This is Gatton Lock, our final lock of the day. next port of call was Cartagena in Colombia, a busy, vibrant city where every second person on the street seemed to want to sell me new sunglasses or a Panama hat. Well, I was escorting a tour that took us to a fort before plunging us right into the very heart of the old town. A disappointing visit to a museum of the Spanish Inquisition was followed by a more promising visit to the cathedral and the busy square. The 16th century old town is surrounded by high walls and is simply bursting with colourful colonial buildings and cobbled streets where horse-drawn carriages queue up to give visitors a tour to remember. Capturing the essence of a busy street in Cartagena is mostly an exercise in observation, reducing complex architectural elements down to their simplest forms. After laying down a few light guidelines to aid with my perspective, I like to block in the basic shapes of the buildings with my trusty ink pen. I always think it doesn't really matter if your lines are a bit wobbly, although I'm sure an architect would disagree with me on that. I reckon a few well-placed wobbles help to add character and will look much better than if they're drawn too timidly. Only when the outer shell of the buildings has been established do I start getting down to the nitty-gritty. I'm happy with my line drawing, it's time to start throwing some paint at it. 
Prussian Blue establishes the sky, while a mixture of raw sienna, burnt umber and French ultramarine are good for capturing the colourful facades of the buildings. And as you can see, I'm encouraging the different colours to bleed together, creating subtle graduations of tone and allowing some space for interpretation, keeping it loose and slightly ambiguous. Once I've established those underlying colours, it's back to the ink pen. Well, mostly this means blocking in the windows with the black ink and selectively adding some shading patterns here and there. I'm also adding bevels to some of the window frames and the corners of the buildings and looking for tiny ledges or other architectural enhancements. Finally, I'm going to drop a smattering of bright colours into the figures and as with the earlier wash, I'm encouraging colours to bleed randomly into each other. The foreground shadow is there to hold it all together. And so to the final section of our voyage, incorporating visits to a small selection of Caribbean islands. The first of these was St Vincent, where Kingstown provided us with just a small sample of what the island has to offer. Fast changing weather patterns resulted in several last minute changes to our itinerary. Kingstown was always going to be a short stop for us, just enough time to check out a few of the old colonial buildings and walk up to the botanical gardens. Instead of Bequea and Meru in the Grenadines, we headed for St George's on the Spice Isle of Grenada. It's a beautiful island, well worth exploring, but having been here before, we chose to take the water taxi to Great Ansas Beach and chill out. It's the Caribbean, that's what folks do here. It was also an opportunity to try out our underwater camera and film some fish. David Attenborough, eat your heart out. stop before heading east across the Atlantic was Bridgetown on the island of Barbados. On our way into town we stopped off to take a look at the fish market which was open and in full swing. We also paused to check out the collection of boats in the harbour and look at Nelson's column in their very own Trafalgar Square. Once again though, our plan for the day was very simple. Find a beach, swim, relax repeat. With the Caribbean fading away into the distance and the memories of our trip so far still fresh in our minds, six long days at sea brought us to our final port stop, Ponta Delgada in the Azores. We only had five hours to enjoy our visit, which we chose to enjoy by taking a leisurely walk into town. A climb to the top of the clock tower gave us some good views across the rooftops and into the harbour. And a relaxed drink in one of the marina side cafes proved to be a fitting end to our adventure. Three more sea days would bring us back to our starting point, Bristol. Those last few days sailing were a little bit on the choppy side. In fact, they were the roughest seas we'd seen since leaving Bristol 70 days earlier. 
In that time, we travelled a total of 18,208 nautical miles and visited 25 ports, not to mention having gathered a shed load of extraordinary memories to take home with us. I spent the last few days running my final few painting classes and organising an exhibition of everyone's work. That meant blue tacking two and a half months worth of classes, 300 odd paintings, to the walls of the corridor by the Columbus Lounge. They did look marvellous though, everyone mingled and showed off their work proudly to their fellow passengers. Even the captain came and took a look. In the immortal words of Mary Poppins and Bart Simpson, my work here was done. All of which concludes this epic voyage around South America. Well, there is just one more thing though before I go. I couldn't leave without adding my own small tribute to the ship that took us there and brought us safely back home, the Marco Polo. I had the pleasure of working on the Marco Polo, running onboard painting workshops a total of 11 times between 2012 and 2019. Our first trip on her was to the Amazon, to which we returned several times. This was followed by trips to the Canary Islands, the Baltic, Iceland and her 50th anniversary tour to Greenland and Canada in 2015. My last voyage on her was in 2019, so the trip I've just shared with you. At the ripe old age of 55, she was a fine old vessel, a great ship, a proper ship. She was originally known as the Alexander Pushkin, and I'm sure all who sailed in her would sing her praises as I have done, not to mention all the fantastic memories and wealth of seafaring stories. Well, I speak of her in the past tense because in 2020, Cruise and Maritime, who owned and ran her, fell victim to the global pandemic that brought a sudden halt to all cruise operations right across the industry. The company went into administration in July of that year and its fleet of ships went up for auction. Despite all hopes for a last-minute reprieve and a possible new life as a floating hotel, none of that was to be. The sad fate of the Marco Polo was for it to be beached in Alang in India to be taken apart for scrap. And so marks the end of an era. 